The following interview was conducted with uh, Christ, Christ, Professor Christian Johansson, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. This is part two. It took place on Friday, February 11, 2010 in Stewart Center. He's also the Director Emeritus of the Lars Laboratory for Applications of Remote Sensing. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Johansson. Thank you very much. Well, it's and a pleasure to be I here. think uh, we'll start with your external appointments. Okay. Um, where do you want me to start? <laughs> I'm going to leave it up to you. We've, you. He's got an extensive list, which is wonderful because he's done a lot of it. So I thought I'd suggest that you I, want to hit the highlights. And well, I think some. that I've I've worked and traveled in over 50 countries, and I really learned early on. Uh, it was really my first experience out of the country other than Mexico and Canada. I don't really count those because they're so close. But it was, uh, I was president-elect of the Soil and Water Conservation Society and uh, got a request if I would join a group of soil scientists to go to China for an exchange. And this was in 1983. And China was just starting to accept visitors at that time and I was fortunate to be paired off well they paired us off by disciplines for for roommates because we were going to be there a month and so we went to seven different provinces in China and we interacted not only with soil scientists but with university personnel and and at each of the universities at least one of us would give a a uh, slight presentation in that. Uh, <clears throat> a little uh, side on this is that uh, my secretary, when she filled out the forms that you needed to fill out for this trip, she listed me as professor of agronomy, and all the other people had put, you know, their title as doctor. And when the Chinese saw this, this was, oh, this person's really important. So I always got to sit at the head table with the leader of the group, who was a little irritated at times because they would always ask me first to give a toast. And so I got pretty good at, at giving toast <laughs> in that. But I was fortunate enough to be paired off with Dr. Daniel Hillel, who is a very well-known uh, soil physicist, and my uh, PhD is in soil physics. And Dan grew up in a kibbutz in Israel and uh, he's uh, been a distinguished professor at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, it turns out that through some of my involvement with NASA, I've gotten him involved in a few committees that I've been on and that type of thing, and we've become very close friends. But Dan taught me about traveling internationally and to always look into the cultures and find out what is important in terms of their relationships with their with their peers, in terms of families and you know the lay of the land. The lay of the land. <clears throat> and it's something I'll always remember because uh, now every time I go to a different country I read up on things about them. And of course you can get the briefings from the State Department and those type of things, but there are other things that one ought to be other looking sources. at. Right. Other sources. And I do that. And so I'm always thankful for that first major trip, even though it was for a month, of being able to uh, be, you know, with Hillel and, and the other uh, soil scientists that were there, because that really was a launching pad, I think, for me in terms of my career as well, because uh, I was, was able to uh, keep in touch with most of those right. people on that trip. That was a good start. So that was a good start. And then it was really great fun to come back about seven years later. I, get, I got back to China in, in 1990. And the contrast was just uh, difficult at times to describe, but the main thing was that the first time we were there, the uniform was either green or blue that people wore. But the children were wearing outfits that, like our kids were, they're bright colors. 
And this uh, is in, the, in 83 when you first In 83 when okay. we went. And so uh, Hillel commented to me that whenever you get back, and he said hopefully they'll be within the next 10 years, he said you're going to see a major change in the dress of these people. And he was absolutely right because here people were, uh, uh, the men were mostly wearing uh, white shirts with ties, and uh, the women had on wonderful uh, colored outfits, and it was it was really a contrast. What a change! What a change! And and the only person you saw in a a, a blue uniform was the, the traffic cop on the corner, and the green were the military, and so that was an interesting oh, contrast yeah, for I me to, so. to see that. So. China, you know, made a lot of changes, uh, you know, between those two trips as far as I was concerned. And even in how the, uh, the students would respond, because even before, they would not ask you any questions. Uh, there was always someone around, and they were just afraid to. But on that second trip, uh, there was I, more I gave several lectures, and, and the students, the students immediately uh, were, you know, just right. really engaging. There was a, uh, a Chinese by the name of Qinghua uh, Li, and uh, Dr. Li had been trained at the University of Illinois, and I was able to meet him on a second trip. And uh, he w was really the father of soil science in China. And it turned out that I was at the University of Missouri at the time, and uh, he uh, uh, had a son there. And uh, then later, his grandson came here to Purdue. And so, what nice. wonderful connections that, you know, I was able to stay with him. You know, he, he lived uh, until uh, he was about 91 or 92, and uh, it, was, it was just interesting to, you know, stay in touch with that family. Sure, sure. Especially since one of them came, a relative came to Purdue. Right, right. I mean, there's, <laughs> it's nice to have those That's Purdue sure connections. Is. Yeah. Uh, I had another uh, uh, major uh, uh, involvement with the country, and that was with Belgium. Uh, we had recruited a um, uh, person to uh, develop remote sensing programs in forestry and natural resources when Dr. Roger Hoffer left Purdue and went to Colorado State. That was his home state, so uh, he was drawn there. And, and I, uh, he always joked that, well, Colorado's got more trees than Indiana. He, he may be right. So <laughs> but uh, the person we'd hired was Dr. Paul Coppin. And uh, Paul was here for five years, and then he uh, received uh, notification that uh, he, he was awarded a distinguished professorship at the uh, Catholic University in Leuven. And uh, uh, it turns out that that university is the uh, uh, second oldest university in Europe. And so, you know, a long distinguished past, but so Paul went back to Belgium. Was he, was he an American? No. Oh, he was from no, Belgium. He, he, was oh, he came over. He okay. came here and did his so PhD with uh, Dr. Mar Bauer, who was here at Lars, but then went up to Minnesota okay. after he'd gotten his degree. And uh, so uh, when when we had hired Paul, why uh, we had that you know connection sure. as well. But uh, uh, Paul wondered how he and I could really uh, stay in touch with one another, and so he happened to be here a couple of years later to uh, uh, a conference, and it was a remote sensing conference, and, and he said, you know, we ought to start a joint program between Purdue and, and Louisville. And I said, oh, I'm interested in that. And so... Uh, I took a few trips to Leuven and visited with their faculty, and he came here. He still had some graduate students, so, so that was always an excuse for him to come back. And we came up with the idea of starting a program called the uh, Earth Observation Program, 
and it would be a, um, a degree that students from Belgium uh, would uh, come to Purdue for one semester, the fall semester, and take basic courses in remote sensing and geographic information systems, in uh, statistics and uh, global positioning systems. And uh, after that semester, uh, see there would be our students would also be involved at the same time taking those same courses. Then the second semester they would go to Belgium. And uh, there they would take courses that would integrate those technologies into modeling and how to apply it in different situations, whether it be soils or vegetation. And, and so it was the students who went through that program then had to go back to their home university and do a, uh, a project for their uh, uh, dissertation. And then we had it worked out that by closed circuit TV, uh, the students would present their results and they would have committee members at both universities. And it, it worked well for about five years. And we had uh, about two dozen students that went through the program. But then Paul was appointed Dean of Ag Culture at Louisville and I retired. And so the program stopped. But it was, it was one of those wonderful interactions, and I still get uh, communications from those students that were, were involved. Yeah. And I even, even from the Louisville faculty, I say, hey, I have so-and-so as a student that would like to come to the U.S. and like to come to Purdue. Is there that so opportunity? So you got that contact, which is so, great. Yeah. Continues on. Continues but, on. Right. So, and I think that's the sort of thing that keeps going and going with these sort of connections. Mm -hmm. Another university that we have had a lot of connections with has been uh, uh, Gudla University at, at Gudla in Hungary, and uh, it's now called uh, St. Bantus University. They wanted to distinguish the name of the university from the town that it was located in, and so uh, that came about. But uh, Marion Baumgartner had uh, the first connections there, and uh, I traveled with him one time uh, to Belgium, and he got me acquainted with the faculty there. And then we we finally decided that we ought to have an exchange program for undergraduate students, so that they would spend a semester at uh, each university. And so uh, the rule was, though, from Purdue that there had to be a faculty member go with the students for a year. Well, we had a difficult time finding a faculty member, and I, I just happened to have a uh, student who uh, had been in Desert Storm. He was a tank commander had gotten his undergraduate degree at West Point in geography and he was working on a master's degree with me and he was a captain. And uh, he was just one of these students that just took charge. And, right. and I took him over to uh, Dean Vic Lechtenberg, he was Dean of Ag Culture at the time, and I said, uh, uh, I'd really uh, like for you to consider Todd to uh, be our uh, adult right. representative. <laughs> and he said, uh, I had first told this to him on the phone, and he said, no, we can't do that, but I'd like to meet Todd. And after he met Todd, he said he was only five minutes into the interview and he knew this had to be the person. And so Todd ended up going uh, with the students, and then even later on, we had an exchange in, in uh, Poland, and he, he took a group of students there. And he loved being in, in other cultures, and, and Todd is now president of his own company out in California, and he does a lot of work for the uh, Defense Department, and it's kind of neat to... It is nice. <coughs> yeah, that's it. worked out well for him. It worked you. out well for him, and it, it especially worked out well for us. I think 
two other places that I'll just mention that I've had some interesting experiences with. One was with Russia. I had uh, I'd gotten an international travel grant to go to Russia because I had become interested in the connection between Russian soil scientists and the uh, U.S. soil scientists. Uh, as we had written up our descriptions of a key for soils uh, back in all the 1920s and 30s, we had a lot of French terms. We used terms like brunisms and chernisms and podzos, and these were all Russian terms. And so uh, I wondered at the time, how did this come about? And while I was at the University of Missouri, I just happened to see a photograph up in the attic of the agronomy department of a gentleman that looked quite distinguished, and I brought that down to one of the retirees, and I said, who is this? And he said, oh, that's Dr. Curtis Fletcher Marvin. And I said, who's he? And he said, oh, he said, he's been one of our Chinese stars. He really was a geologist, but he started mapping soils and pretty soon he was heading the soil survey program for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so as, as I looked into the background of Dr. Marvin, I found that he was the one that had made the connections with the Russians. And the person that he had connected with was Vivi Dokichai. And this really happened during the Columbian Expedition in Chicago. And the dis there was a display of soils that the Russians had put together of their soils. And so... That was in 1931, 30, something like that, 32? It was in sometime during that time. Right, yeah. It may 33. have been a little bit earlier than that. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and anyway, uh, when Marbert heard that they were putting together the soils, he convinced the USDA that their display so. also... And it turned out they were right across the aisle from one another. And Dokachev was there, and Marvit was there, and so the two started, you know, communicating. Well, I wanted to go to the Dokachev Soil Science Institute in Moscow, and so I uh, had contacted them, and, and uh, their director had given me a letter uh, inviting me to come there. And they asked if I would give a seminar, you know, over anything that I want, and I said, I would like to do it over uh, relationships between Russian soil scientists and U.S. soil scientists, because I had a student at the time that was an anthropologist, and this was while I was at the University of Missouri, uh, getting where this background really started, but it was while I was here at Purdue that I had that actual exchange. And uh, uh, the student, was one who could go into the library and search out so many things, and he found photographs of, of uh, Marbet and, and Dokachai together. He found uh, lots of other things that involved the Russians, including, uh, as I was giving the presentation, uh, it started out that there were about 20 people in the room. Now, the room would probably hold about 70 people. And so there weren't very many there. And I started, you know, giving some information. Pretty soon someone would go out and there'd be about 10 more people come back in. And this kept going on until the room was full. As a matter of fact, it was standing room only uh, toward last. But I had shown a slide of Anna Dokachai, which was Bibi Dokachai's wife. She was also a soil scientist, and the Russians didn't even know that. And here I was in the Dokachev Institute, and they didn't have, oh, giving them a talk, and they were just—I mean, they had questions, and it—it it was went over very well. It was really interesting. And so when the presentation was done, and it—it it took me over two hours because they were asking questions all the time. Uh, and the last question was. Is, is there a possibility that we could have a copy of your slides? Well, I had already made a copy of these slides because 
I was afraid if I would lose them someplace, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have a presentation to give. So I picked up the tray that slides on a projector and I handed it to the, to the director and I said, here, why don't you take these? And there was an applause for that, obviously. <laughs> And so that was <laughs> super. Go Boilers. So we, uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, memorandum of understanding now with the Dovachive Institute and uh, Purdue University so that we can still do exchanges. And uh, uh, Dr. Baumgartner and I have both been there, as well as I know there have been people from Forestry have made contact with them and have, have spent some okay. time there. So. There's been a few more things going on as a result of that. Then there's one other country that, that I'll mention that I uh, uh, had a, an interesting experience, and that was in Saudi Arabia. I received a call from uh, uh, a former uh, colleague of mine who was, we, we had met at the University of Nebraska and he was working for the uh, Office of International Cooperation uh, in uh, uh, Washington. It was part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, there was a contract with Saudi Arabia that uh, when Kissinger was Secretary, uh, was Secretary of State, he had worked out an arrangement for every barrel of oil that we bought from Saudi Arabia, that there would be a small percent of that would be put into a fund which the Saudis could draw on to bring experts from the U.S. over to work with counterparts. And uh, they were looking for someone in remote sensing, and, and I, I got the call from this colleague saying, is there a possibility that, that I could talk you into going to Saudi Arabia? And I said, wow, I've never been there. I'd like that. And uh, he said, well, well, we'll try to work out an arrangement to, to do that. And it turned out that uh, uh, they worked it out that there was uh, a person from uh, uh, Virginia, uh, BPI, and Texas A&M and myself. And we first went to uh, Jeddah, uh, King Abdulaziz University at Jeddah. And we spent two weeks there, just visiting with different faculty and, and uh, essentially getting acquainted. Sure. We all gave uh, seminars. And uh, uh, when it was all over, <clears throat> I was asked if I would go to Riyadh and meet with the uh, director of the Ministry of Agriculture and Water. And uh, uh, the other two people went home, and so I ended up going up to Riyadh. And then I found out that the ministry there was very interested in having a workshop on remote sensing. And they didn't really say this until about the fourth day that I was there, and I was had gone around and shook all the hands and drank an awful lot of tea with uh, <laughs> the different ministers. <laughs> and it uh, turned out that uh, uh, about six months later, I was asked to put together a workshop and to uh, uh, bring colleagues that I thought could be of assistance. Well. I had worked very closely with Terry Barney at the University of Missouri, and, and Terry and I were close colleagues. He was a geographer, and uh, I have lots of connections, by the way, with geographers, and I have a great respect for their field. Anyway, uh, Terry and I ended up going to uh, Riyadh, and when I got there, uh, the first time, uh, you, you come into the airport and you, you report to the uh, uh, military office of the U.S., which is right there at the military, and there's the officer of the day, and they will assign a car to you and a driver. Well, the second time when I got there, it was the same officer of the day, and he said, 
I don't have a driver right now. He said, uh, where did you uh, fly in from? And I said, well, I have been a few days in Rome uh, working with the Food and Agricultural Organization. And he said, uh, did you drive in Rome? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I did. And he said, anybody that can drive in Rome can drive here. <laughs> I would think so. And he handed me the <laughs> keys. And of course, Terry Barney, who was with me, rolled his eyes, and he knew right away he was going to have to be the map reader, you know, to get us into Riyadh. So that was an interesting experience, just so. driving around Riyadh <laughs> and having the car. But we got along very well. We were... Uh, uh, one of the things we were, I was able to convince them was that I wanted the students in the workshop, and there were about 30 of them. Uh, they were from mostly from the Ministry of Ag and Water, but I suspect they snuck a military person in there and a few other things. But uh, we uh, uh, had asked if we could go to the receiving station that they had and see some data downloaded live of an area in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and hopefully it'd be around the Riyadh area, and then that we would go out into the field and look at this. Well, it turned out the French spot satellite, that day we were out there, was just then downloading, they were downloading the image, and you could see it on the screen, you know, being downloaded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, ooh, that's the one. And uh, they brought us a paper copy, and I showed the uh, Saudis. Uh, you could pick out the center pivots, irrigation systems, and they were doing some of their own irrigating, particularly of wheat. And uh, I had picked out a couple of them that I'd like to see, and they said, well, uh, we really need to make contact with the landowners. And it took them two days to do that. but. We had other things to teach, and finally, you know, one day they said, oh, we're going on a field trip, we're going now. And so they loaded us in vans, and we got out there, and the place that we ended up going to was where the, there was a very large center pivot, and it was a member of the royal family. And we first had to see his house of pigeons that he had, he must have had 150 pigeons in his pigeon house, and then from there we went out to see his irrigation system. And when we, when we got up close, I could see it was a Caterpillar engine on his, on his well and it was pumping away. And I went around the side and looked and there was a plate on there that said, Made in Lafayette, Indiana. And I pulled out my driver's license and oh, showed right. that to him. And from there, I could do no wrong. Right, it was there you go. We got just right one here. of those wonderful experiences. And so. Uh, there was lots of other things that I really enjoyed uh, understanding more about that right. that country. In uh, Riyadh, you spoke in English, though, don't oh, you? Oh yes, yeah, right. yes. All of all of the workshop was in English. Right. Are the students were they primarily from that country, or were there some from? They other were country? all from that country. Okay. But many of them had uh, obtained degrees either in England or the U.S. I would think England too, because you think of the British, yep. because it's closer and they've had more ties over the years. Yeah. This was the interesting thing, even uh, in Belgium, where Flemish was the language that mm -hmm. they spoke at the undergraduate level, but at the graduate level it was English, and so that's why our Earth Observation uh, program worked out so well. Sure. It was, it could bring any of our instructors over. And All right. Yeah. So. Uh, so, what's uh, any other specific one? And do you want to? Um, well, I, I, to I've had a lot of experience uh, uh, in uh, France and, and Italy. Italy, a lot of that started with the Food and Agricultural Organization. I see that. And uh, I became well acquainted with uh, uh, a man by the name of Dr. Rudy Dudal. Uh, Marion Baumgartner had introduced me to him on a trip that he and I had made to Belgium one time. And uh, from that, uh, Rudy uh, went from the university at Ghent to uh, uh, head up the division of land and, land and water resources within uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO. 
And so each time that I came to Rome, I would, before I even went to the remote sensing facility, I would stop in and see Dr. Dudal, and we would visit. And, and uh, when I was uh, uh, president of the Soil and Water Conservation Society, I had convinced him to come here and, and uh, give a presentation, one of the keynote speakers. And then during the Earth Observation Program, he had retired uh, from FAO, and instead of going back to Ghent, he went to the Catholic University at Leuven. And so uh, he had an office there, and so again I was able to sure. interact with him, and he was a, a, a great person. So. It was, it was just a joy that that sort of connection had, uh, continued, had on. continued for me. Right. <clears throat> but the FAO uh, had found that if, if people were going to learn remote sensing in many of the developing countries, that they were going to have to teach the workshops, or at least organize them, and bring in experts from other countries to assist in teaching that. And I had my first experience of that in uh, Kenya. I was uh, called in to uh, assist in a, in a two-week workshop. And the first week was spent in the classroom and, and uh, we would show the students how to uh, interpret the different images and uh, we did some uh, classifications for them and then uh, there was an area close by Nairobi where we were at. It was really Mount Kenya. But if you went around Mount Kenya, you found that you had a rainforest on one side and a desert on the other. And so during that second week, we would take the students and we would, we would have these images and they would have their classification results and they would be able to see firsthand what they were really defining and it was it was just one of the more memorable type of experiences sure. that I've had of being able to you know have that type of laboratory Absolutely. type of teaching <laughs> that was that was just a gold mine to do that and so I you know learned a lot even about the Kenyans and uh, had been back there a number of times because uh, the person who uh, was uh, working for uh, our State Department that was heading up the remote sensing facility in Nairobi was trying to work himself out of a job. And that was his instructions. You teach a Kenyan how to run that lab and then you know we'll find work for you somewhere else. Well that was Dr. Alan Faulkner and Alan was a Brit and uh, had, uh, had the most wonderful accent that you'd ever hear and uh, we became great friends and he uh, uh, they needed a review of the overall program and the turning over of this program to uh, to the Kenyans and so I was called back for that and so I chaired the review committee and it turned out one of the people in the State Department that was there he had been in Nairobi for a number of years. Uh, I just could tell by the way he made some of his comments that he was a pilot. And so I asked him, uh, are you a pilot? And he said, yes. And I said, well, you're living here in Nairobi. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you maintain your, your currency on flying? And he said, well, I have my own airplane. And I said, oh, I would give anything to see the Rift Valley. And he said, we have time tomorrow morning. <laughs> and so I got to see the, you know, the Rift Valley and even got to then fly around Mount Kenya that I before had gone around in an automobile. I mean, boy, does it That's get any it. better than that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It's like I went to heaven and came back, <laughs> yeah, right? That, that, was, I that was close. Uh, mm -hmm. Alan Faulkner, by the way, came and worked in the... Uh, uh, Eros Data Center after that in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and uh, we maintained our contacts that way, and then there was a position open at uh, Stennis Space Center, 
and I recommended him for that position, and he took that. And then later, uh, he got a call from uh, uh, the uh, Mason uh, University in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, is it Mason? Or George Washington? George Washington, that's right. what I'm trying to think of. Yeah, right. Anyway, uh, uh, he's the uh, head of the geography department there. And so we still have an interaction, sure. and, and uh, every time go to Washington D.C., well, got somebody to look right got along somebody with to look forward to to connect with. So. Uh, let's see. We go. How about uh, some foreign visitors that you hosted? Do you want to just make a couple comments yes. on that? Yes. Uh, Which is a follow up to the teaching right. things that you've done. Yes. It's been interesting that uh, uh, you know I became the director of Lars in. 1986 after I'd been here you know returned I'd returned here in 1985 mm -hmm. and so in 86 I was asked if I'd also be director of Lars and immediately I found that we had a lot of visitors that would come to Lars and they would either want training or they wanted the latest information that we had and so uh, uh, I kept a pretty good log of visitors and uh, uh, where they were from and, and why they were there and, and even to this day there are still people coming and uh, as I started looking at the list they were they were from all over uh, they uh, uh, they came uh, from Brazil they came from Australia they came from Armenia they came from Portugal, Spain, New Zealand, uh, Australia, uh, I don't already Wonderful mentioned that. Listing. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing that I'd get to interact with them mm -hmm. as well as uh, provide information for them uh, of other places that they might visit in the U.S. while they were here. Sure. Because... You're a good resource. Well, I, yeah. I maintain a connectivity, uh, particularly with other colleagues. Uh, that, and so uh, depending upon, you know, their interest and what they were really looking for, well, we could usually find a place that, that they could visit sure. even after right. here. So a lot of times I, I would receive an email from someone and say, I'm coming to the U.S. and wonder if you'd be available on such and such a date and I'd always inquire as to where else they were going and well they were still deciding their schedule and then right. I'd assist them in working out a schedule and so uh, uh, and that still goes on to this day even you know yeah, during this last coming. year I think I uh, uh, had several visitors uh, one of which uh, is you got one from Nairobi yes oh, and that's Dr. Uh, Norberto Fernandez who uh, got his degree, his PhD here at Purdue, under Dr. Uh, Daryl Schultz. I was on his committee, and I hired Norberto as a uh, postdoc for three years in the uh, late uh, 1980s. And from there, uh, he went to work for uh, uh, the uh, United Nations and uh, he was first located in Mexico because he was originally from Argentina. And then he got the opportunity to go to Nairobi. And uh, there he's, he's now worked his way up that he's uh, the, the chief of the early warning system uh, for the United Nations. And uh, he has become a real expert on tsunamis because when that the, the well, latest one that hit there uh, uh, in off of India, why uh, that uh, really started things in motion for getting better equipment and getting warnings out much faster than they, they had been. And so <clears throat> uh, he deals with flooding, with fire, and you know all of those sort of things, and is is the person that helps different countries put together that, that sort Which of software. So much needed today. Yes. Is he still, um, but he's based in Nairobi still? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. As a matter of fact, 
uh, he and his wife have have uh, uh, bought land and built a house there. Their children went off to uh, Germany and to France to get their degrees, and they all have their advanced degrees now. And it's just really <laughs> interesting <right>. to. <laughs> yeah. Well, he said that you know he he learned while he was here at Purdue that uh, Purdue really had good international connections, and uh, he wanted to you know foster that and get involved. Sure somehow and so yeah, that's interesting. and you recently had somebody from South Africa that came yes uh, South Africa is is uh, one of those countries that uh, really has a lot of good technology going and there is an excellent program going between them and the uh, Catholic University at Leuven they are building their own satellite uh, in South Africa, the one in South Africa. Uh, the South Africans are building the satellite, and the uh, Belgians are providing the sensors to put on that satellite. And uh, it's going to be uh, what we call a hyperspectral satellite, meaning that it has very narrow wavelength bands. A lot of our satellites have wide bands, and consequently, you can't get a complete definition of what you're really looking for, like with the hyperspectral, you can start detecting the different pigments in vegetation from space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's that sort of fineness that, that one is looking for. And so uh, uh, it was really through the Belgians that, you know, the South Africans came here That's because right, they wanted yeah. to know where, where was the best place to learn about remote <laughs> sensing in the U.S. Uh, so. <coughs> yeah, you said that um, you spent a three-month sabbatical here, right? Huh? Yes. Oh, that's yes. Nice. Very nice. Oh. So there's there's lots of those, you know, sort of connections. I've uh, I also have a real fondness for uh, Turkey, and so does Purdue. We have, uh, particularly at the university at Ankara, uh, many of the faculty, particularly in agriculture, have degrees from here, and. Uh, I was I was able to spend some time there in Ankara and as well as uh, then traveling much of uh, central and, and western Turkey, uh, really looking at their their land use and and trying to get a better feel for the history of of Turkey and uh, I must admit that you know spending two weeks in driving, by the way, <laughs> uh, was a, just an excellent experience. Uh, there, the one thing you find out in driving in Turkey is that there aren't any highway maps that can really assist you uh, because the highways aren't numbered. Uh, their main thoroughfares are, but that's it. And so what you do is you get a general idea of where you want to go and you, you have a map that shows where the different cities are. And when you get to the next city or, or large town, you go to the center part of the city where the roundabout is, and there will be signs with an arrow as to the, the direction. <laughs> and you go in that direction <laughs> oh, until wow. you get to that town, and then you you start know, you over look, again. You start right. over For again, you go one. to the roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> It was a great experience. Yeah. Oh, just a couple uh, comment on that. You're the remote sensing. You're the senior editor, and then talk a little bit about NASA. And okay. Your on sure. That. Uh, a few years ago, we we started a uh, electronic journal uh, that is called the Journal of of uh, uh, Terrestrial Observation, and what we wanted to do was to be able to uh, publish papers electronically and put them online so that people could have ready access to them. It's a peer review uh, uh, type of journal. I, uh, uh, I share the uh, editorship with uh, Dr. Gilbert Rochon, and it was Gilbert who had the idea to, to start this in the first place. 
he does a lot of traveling, and so he convinced me to work with him. And pretty soon I noticed I was, you know, an associate editor and now co-editor. And I find that for me, being a person in retirement, uh, it's wonderful to see the articles coming in and to read them and stay current in your own field. And I, uh, I always make a habit of reading through the articles after they've even been peer-reviewed very carefully and, and make sure that everything is right, right that, that they didn't miss something, and especially related to the language. I've, I've, I've taught myself to be even a good editor, and, and I do a lot of reviewing of articles for other people as well. I suspect that during the year I will do reviews of at least 30 major manuscripts. Uh, just, and, and uh, you know, I feel I could almost walk into the classroom and start teaching on go. some of this. That's published by Purdue Press, isn't it? That's it's right. Sure. Purdue Press is... Oh, the Purdue Press is yes. doing it. I thought so. Yes. Okay. And so uh, uh, we... Uh, are on track to get out at least two uh, issues a year. I think that as this uh, becomes more familiar to other people in the discipline, that we may, you know, start coming out quarterly. But sure. uh, we just have to keep working at it. All right. Okay. And so right now we're busy uh, getting ready, getting ready for that, as well as distributing information about it. Uh, not only electronically, but uh, at different conferences, we have advertisements about it. So, good. Okay, NASA, and you on the uh, remote sensing associate member committee for a long time. I was, I, I did a, a number of different things with NASA, and and it, it started out when they asked me to be on the. Uh, uh, Earth Science uh, Committee, and it was Earth Science and Land Use Committee, and there was a uh, uh, one of the the people that was on this committee was Dr. Uh, Jack Dangerman, who is the president of uh, ESRI, which is the leading software for geographic information systems. And he was just in the beginning stages of this, of putting it together. And Jack and I have become close friends over the years. Uh, by the way, his company did $2 billion worth of business last year. Uh, he's doing very well. Uh, I, uh, I get a call from him every once in a while, would I come out to his conference? He holds a user's conference each spring out in... Uh, uh, Redland, California, and uh, and now he, here lately it's gotten so big that he holds it in San Diego, and uh, uh, it's just one of the advantages of getting on some of these committees. Does well, it? I then you know got on a number of review committees with NASA, and this then led to uh, uh, being put on the uh, uh, Space Studies Board. And that is part of the National Research Council. So NASA has to pay attention to that because the National Research Council uh, will put together findings that NASA needs to pay attention to, as well as uh, the people in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. NOAA has all these satellites for the weather uh, satellites, and then uh, U.S. Geological Survey, which is a repository for many of the images that are obtained, also has to, to pay attention to uh, that. And I found that uh, uh, this was exciting because here were people that were uh, astrophysicists and and uh, biologists and meteorologists and you know there was every discipline represented on that and uh, I don't know uh, after you know a couple of years I got reappointed to that and then all of a sudden I was on the executive committee and uh, the executive committee would always meet at Woods Hole 
in Massachusetts. And uh, what a wonderful place to hold meetings. Uh, here you are in a conference room and you look out the windows and there's nothing but sailboats. <laughs> I've heard it's a nice, yeah, that's right. It's, it's a lovely, it. lovely place. And, uh, but the, uh, the other thing was that the Space Studies Board would try to meet at all of the different NASA facilities. And so I've been to every one of them. And, uh, and there are about 10 of them located around the U.S. And, and that has really been an, uh, an eye-opener to me yeah. to get acquainted with scientists in those different... They're working in that. They're, they're working on different projects. And, and, you know, it's one of those lifetime type experiences that's that right. you really relish. Life, that's, that's right. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I think uh, one of uh, the recent significant publications, I thought that uh, one that you did on the pre visible, that might be good. Or any of you might want okay. to mention those. Uh, I think that uh, there's, there's, a, there's several publications that uh, I've been working on here lately, and, and one of them happens to be with a former uh, student, Keith Morris, where we, we did a uh, uh, a chapter for the Encyclopedia of Soils on the use of remote sensing for soil mapping. And Keith was, Keith was one of these uh, graduate students that came to me and he was in his late 30s and he uh, had his undergraduate and master's degree in ag engineering but he wanted an agronomic phase of that. And so uh, he did his PhD with me. And uh, uh, we, we did a lot of work out at the uh, Purdue Davis farm, which is located in the eastern part of the state. And uh, that particular uh, research farm devotes itself to precision ag culture. And so all work related to precision ag culture Stunner. is concentrated there. And so we used it as, as a test site for a lot of the uh, gathering of NASA data. So now we had two NASA test sites, one the Agronomy Research Center here in West Lafayette and, and the Davis Farm. Another uh, interesting one that I've, I've done with uh, uh, a student that, that came here from uh, Greece, uh, she had done her uh, uh, undergraduate work with, uh, uh, with one of the agronomy professors, and I uh, worked with her on her master's, and then she did her PhD in ag engineering. So she was the reverse of, of Keith Morris. And she's now at uh, Texas A&M. But we, uh, uh, we did a project where we looked at the use of satellite data for uh, mapping floodplains. And uh, you, you find that uh, it's difficult to obtain an image over an area when it's being flooded because generally there still are clouds around. You know, satellites are a fair weather game. And if, if the sun isn't shining, why you're not going to get the image that you want. And so we were we were able to use uh, images using microwave to get uh, the digital terrain features of a landscape and older satellite data and merge them. And through that, we could then see whereabouts you know, flooding would occur. And of course, we also combined with that soil maps because soils, uh, a soil map is going to tell you an area that floods. But it's interesting that uh, soil maps vary in, in, in terms of how often, you know, different soils flood. And what you want is where is that 100-year flood and that 500-year flood? and digital terrain data would we'll give, you, we'll that give you that information. So that basically we could tell if people had already built in the floodplain and 
and that's always of interest to planners, and so we, we worked on those sort of maps. Then I had another student, uh, Randy Hamilton, and we did a, uh, uh, an effort where uh, it turns out that grubs are, are a problem not only in people's lawns, but uh, uh, people that are running golf courses also find that grubs are a big problem. And so Randy got the idea of looking at uh, plots uh, that we located here close by the airport that we had a number of different uh, grasses that are used out on fairways and golf courses and then he was able to uh, put grubs different density of grubs in those and 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 we took images from uh, I call them a high ranger in a bucket over top of the uh, plots themselves where we had sensors that came right looked right down on the plot and so we got really some good data that told us what particular bands one could start detecting the type of stress caused by grubs eating off the roots of, of the uh, grasses and uh, uh, that turned out very well. Uh, actually, uh, we published a number of papers and there was obviously very strong involvement from the entomology department uh, in that. Randy is now a uh, research scientist with the U.S. Forest Service uh, out in Utah. And so uh, uh, it's, it's one of the things when when Joe, my wife, and I travel, we, we have no trouble stopping in and <laughs> Seeing one of our former students. Right. Oh. <laughs> oh, a couple things on your retirement activities that we didn't mention the last time. Uh, one was the West Lafayette Redevelopment Authority, and then I thought the Rotary were pretty active in that. Yes. The uh, uh, Redevelopment uh, Authority is a, uh, or commission, is a, uh, a group that is under the uh, city government, the mayor's office obviously, that looks at different construction activities going on in the community with the eye on the infrastructure needed for the support of different activities that are going on. And a good example of this is out at the Purdue Research Park. Uh, there's still a lot of the land there that is uh, available for people to, to build on. But what we were looking at is what type of infrastructure do we need to put in there in terms of not only the roads and, and the proper runoff, uh, stormwater runoff, but where should the, uh, uh, the telephone lines go and, and the sewers and the water and you know all of that because the city would be involved in, in a number of those things. And so uh, there was an excellent partnership that, uh, between Purdue and, and the West Lafayette uh, administration here. And, and so it was, it was a joy to not only work on some of those things but even the uh, trails in the community, and I have a tremendous interest in that because my wife and I like to go hiking. Uh, we always say that if, if if it's not good enough for golf, it's it's good enough to walk the trail. And so we've walked many of, of the trails, but there's a, uh, I forget how many miles of, of trails there are in this community, but you know, there's several dozen and they go way out, particularly out into some of the uh, subdivisions and particularly where there are uh, uh, apartment buildings where the students can ride in on their bicycles. Uh, so uh, that was, it was an interesting experience to, to do that. That land out there, of course, the research is owned by Purdue. That's Purdue. correct. And so, because when I first came here years ago, park was not the size it is today. No. <laughs> it is growing even right. as we speak. That's right. And Rotary. What, uh, Rotary. Yeah. Rotary is an uh, 
an interesting uh, yeah, quite a few organization. people belong to that <laughs> locally I've heard yes yeah. uh, I uh, I got involved in this uh, during the, the middle 80s uh, dr. Uh, Marvin Phillips who was head of the agronomy department says you know you belong in rotary and so he sponsored me and I found that uh, there's lots of things that Rotary does, not only in this community, because we have a Lafayette Rotary Foundation that works on different projects for the community, like providing uh, assistantships to the top scholars in all of the high schools of the community. We, by the way, for each luncheon, will bring in two of the top seniors from each school and so they get a chance to interact, you know, with the Rotarians. The Rotarians do, does have a, what somebody described as a movers and a shakers in a community, but uh, I've, I've enjoyed uh, working with Rotary because, uh, one, I can get involved in those projects, like we have a backpack program where students that are, are receiving uh, uh, meals at school, uh, we felt that, gee, their family probably also needs additional food. So every Friday, we have a full backpack of food that this we have put together. This was recently written up in the paper, one of the, school, the schools, there's an article about yes. that. Uh -huh. and it's Miami Elementary mm -hmm. School that, that we work with. And, Interestingly enough that several of the other organizations have also uh, sponsored now other schools to do the same. And so every Friday why you see these kids with a, with a backpack, you know, that instead of full of books, why it's, it's full of food for the rest of the family. Right. Uh, I uh, uh, also, uh, I contribute money to uh, the International Foundation because the International Foundation uh, gets involved in many projects. One is we're trying to eliminate polio and uh, uh, the Gates Foundation came to Rotary International and said we will give you 200 million if you match it in order to eradicate polio because we see the effects that that disease has on people, particularly in developing countries. And so uh, we're now in the uh, third year of focusing on that and we're getting very close. Uh, interestingly enough, we're, we're within 20 or 30 million of, of achieving that 200 million from the membership all over the, all over the world. Good. So, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Gates Foundation, they gave their money up front. They knew that Rotary would come through with the money, and I thought that was an interesting vote yeah. of confidence for Rotary. I have a son uh, who lives in, in Minneapolis, and he gives uh, $75 a month from his uh, paycheck to uh, Rotary uh, for the, uh, it's a, uh, uh, disaster pack program. It's this large container that contains uh, uh, a tent and food and all the items that a family of, of six would need to survive for a month. And uh, uh, what's interesting about his $75, his company matches it, so oh, that's nice. every, every month he's responsible for $150 going and he's not a Rotarian uh, he, but he says realizes he's, the value of but he realizes the value he's interested in that, that yeah. so uh, I've just been so proud that you know he's been able to, to, yeah, to do good. that so and in closing I was going to ask you about a quote uh, extension work work where you learn to be a connector and you smile and for the <laughs> recording he smiles when I mention that <laughs> I had, we all need to connect. <laughs> we all need to connect, but you know, there's there's different ways of connecting, and I found and different applications and different applications of that. I mean, you know, one could 
could say, hey, I want to uh, make sure that I stay connected so that, uh, you know, I can, can utilize these people to do things for me. Uh, I've always looked at it that if, if I could get acquainted with people and we could do something together or I could help them, maybe somebody that, that they've helped would help me along the line and it's all that sort of connector. I'm, I maintain a, a database of about 3,000 names and it, it's names, addresses, phone numbers, uh, and a little bit of information about them. You know, what's their expertise, and if I've met their family, I've got the family names down. And it's that sort of thing I've been able to uh, keep in touch with people. And if somebody, you know. Instant recall, when somebody calls you, you got somebody that's great. I got somebody that, and it's frequent that uh, people will call and say, I've got this article that is written on such and such a topic and I need somebody that would review it for me and I usually can come up with a name for them because uh, uh, that's a great resource well it instant you know really <coughs> it's hard sometimes to scratch your head and get somebody but it's interesting that uh, through all this process I've learned the other connectors and so you know if I can't help someone, I can point them to someone else that can probably uh, do the connecting for them that they need. And so it, it's, it's just been one of the joys that I've had in, in my career of being able to uh, s stay connected. There you go. <laughs> Anything uh, that I, I missed asking that uh, comes to mind? No, I, uh, I, uh, I've really enjoyed, you know, Sharing. Not only my professional career, but I've enjoyed just sharing some stories, right. you know, yeah. with you on some interesting things that's happened on my road. Good. I want to thank you very much, Professor Johan. This has been very nice. Thank you.